Welcome to our latest charity webinar, which is co-hosted by Quilt Achieviot, Brian Jacobson and Moore Kingston-Smith. This session, we're going to be exploring partnerships, collaboration and mergers. Uh, is this a, uh, the route to greater impact and greater efficiencies? By way of introduction, uh, my name is Charles Mosquito. I'm a Charities Director at Quilt Achieviot, but I'm also a trustee of RR Glasspool, uh, Bow Research UK and Prism the Gift Fund. I, for my sins, are going to be moderating this session. I'm joined on the panel, panel by um, Sonia, who is Director of Programme and Partnership at Turn to Us. Uh, she joined, I believe, in 2019, so has been there for a couple of years, having previously worked at ActionAid, um, defeating deafness, uh, Bernardo's, and served on the board of the Women's Environmental Network, WEN, to be short, uh, for two years. Sonia has focused for the last 10 years in the humani humanitarian sector on women's leadership, shifting power and accountability uh, to affect communities. Turn to us, many of you will know, but it's a national charity that provides practical information and support to people who are struggling with money, yeah, as well as uh, providing financial uh, support. They have an amazing website, uh, which has a benefits calculator and demystifying the uh, the, the, the benefits and welfare system and also an ability to be able to so search out or signpost to uh, grant makers where you're eligible for support, which I believe there are over 1,500 of them. Uh, and then we've also got Sharon Davis, who is Chief Executive of Young Enterprise, uh, which is an enterprise and financial educational charity operating across the UK and part of the Junior Achievement Worldwide Network. Since 1963, Young Enterprise has engaged over four and a half million young people in financial and enterprise education uh, and has supported over 1.1 million, which I think is an extraordinary figure of young people, to set up and run uh, Young Enterprise student business. Uh, including Sharon, me, Charles. Including you. Yeah. Ah, well, you have to tell us about that experience <laughs> shortly. Um, uh, Sharon is a qualified youth worker. Uh, passionate about opening up opportunities for young people and when she has spare time which I suspect is not that much she is a keen open water open water swimmer so a marathon swimmer in the sea I assume that is uh, and also a scuba diver uh, we my regular panelists we've got Catherine Ross Jomji one of the leading charity lawyers um, with over 20 years experience um, a partner at Brown Jacobson, trustee of Yorkshire uh, Cancer Research, trustee of BJ Charitable Trust, a grant-making charity, and last but certainly not least is James Saunders, award-winning, obviously, um, entre entrepreneur, student entrepreneur, which no doubt he'll tell us about, uh, but he's a partner at uh, Moore Kingston Smith. One of his um, areas of uh, specialism is educational sector. He's a trustee advisor to a number of independent schools, academies, and multi-academy trusts. And also in his spare time, uh, he is a keen uh, cricketer uh, and supports his local cricket club. Anyway, uh, enough of that uh, to turn to uh, set the scene. Uh, the last 20 years we um, seen a massive transformation in the professionalization and the expansion of the charity sector. Today we've got around 166,000 charities on the Charity Commission for England and Wales. There are about 24,000 in Scotland and 11,000 in Northern Ireland and in fact if you then count those that are not on the register there are a considerable number more. We know uh, that they are an important part of the social fabric of our everyday life. Um, they make uh, a, the world a much better place. They make us uh, a better people and enable us ability to give back to society. Um, however, obviously with the pandemic, charities have, had, have faced um, a significant um, challenges, both in delivery of services and also in, um, uh, in, in their finances. Um, so on that, I think we'll sort of start, perhaps I'll start with you, Sonia, is sort of what is your experience uh, of working in partnerships uh, with other organizations and what lessons have you learned uh, over the last few years? Thanks. Um, so quite a lot of experience working in partnerships. In my previous life at ActionAid, um, I worked in quite a lot of quite large partnerships looking at trying to transform the humanitarian system and, and shifting power. 
Um, and more recently, um, working with a group in, in this, in, from Turn to Us, working with a group called the Grant Makers Alliance, which is a group of individual grant makers. Um, so we all do a fairly similar thing, which I think is quite interesting. So other organisations like Buttle, Glasspool, Small Word, Hospitality Action. So we've come together um, to create a, a kind of a new alliance um, over the last year or so. Um, of, of partnerships. So, so those are probably the ones I'll kind of draw on the most in, in the conversation. Um, and the, the, the lessons I've really learned, I, I think the main thing is like most, mostly partnerships work when you're coming around a common problem. It's not common organisations that's the issue. It's actually what is it that you want to tackle together? Um, and as I mentioned in the humanitarian system, that was you know, quite large, wicked, complex problems. And in the individual grant making sector, we're all very committed to saying, well, we know that um, we've all been making grants for a long, long time. Some of us are over 100 years and on really the same issues. So people have been needing money for the same things for a very, very long time. Um, and what we don't want to be is part of the problem and still doing that in another 100 years. And so we've all recognised together that actually is there something we can do more collectively, more collaboratively in partnership to look at more of the structural reasons that people need grants? Why are they living in this financial hardship in a wealthy um, country? What's the kind of complex issues that they're tackling? And what can we do more collectively to try and tackle that? And it's also from the perspective of saying, well, um, people have to apply separately for lots of individual grants to lots of different organisations. How can we work better together? And we know that as individual grant makers, this hasn't really happened before. So we know it's quite new. Um, so I think the main lesson is what's the common problem that you've got that you want to work on together that you know as an individual organisation you cannot solve on your own? Brilliant. Thank you for that, Tonya. Uh, um, Sharon, um, What's your experience been from uh, from with mergers rather than partnerships? Or you can talk about partnerships as well. Um, and uh, it, it, yes, no. Uh, and, and what lessons did you learn? Yeah, um, I have been in view, uh, involved in a few mergers. Probably the, the, the most recent one is the merger um, of PFEG, the Personal Financial Education Group, with Young Enterprise. Um, I think it's just you just be really clear about what you what the new organisation needs to achieve. I mean, we were. Um, really clear as, as an organisation how we would benefit from a merger with PFEG. Um, Young Enterprise provides financial enterprise education and uh, um, work readiness. Um, but the brand of PFEG was very, very strong with teachers, very, very strong with teachers. And I think it's just about being really clear about what each organisation is set to gain, uh, but also contribute, because very often in mergers, more so with acquisitions, but very often in mergers, you focus as an organisation very much on what you're set to get or you're set to take. Uh, and that just kind of sets you up with the wrong kind of mindset from the start, really. So I think uh, our experience was very be clear from the start that, that PFEG was a very trusted brand, uh, particularly with teachers uh, in the realms of financial education, very trusted, very honest broker um, in terms of financial education. So, I mean, we learned quite a lot along the way of the importance of really thinking about how that brand then becomes converted in a merged organisation. So very soon you're thinking about things like, what does that new brand look like? How do you convert that trust and maintain those stakeholders' trust in the new organisation? So very soon you're into very complex ground quite quickly, quite quickly into those conversations. So I think my lessons would be really stand off as much as you can before committing to, when you're doing your due diligence really think about what the value of that new organization will create think about the possible things that can get in the way of uh, a you know achieving that value so things like how do you create that new brand what would be the obstacles to do that and really look to um, engage those stakeholders those valued stakeholders right from the start and, and and do you remember what the catalyst was that sort of started the process going was it were you actively going out and looking was it because of sort of financial difficulties of one organization or the other um or, or... I think... Yeah, I think I think that both organisations. I mean, I think it was a, it was a conversation between the two chief execs at the time. I think we were both set to benefit. I think um, PFEG at that time were uh, very strong financially and were thinking about their next. They're coming to the end of a strategy. I think at the time, and they were thinking about how how could they scale up their 
um, their ambition to provide you know more sustainable financial education we had great reach at the time um, in terms of the work that we were doing so it seemed like a really good opportunity for them for us to also look at how we could explore more sustainable financial education so working closer with teachers because at that time we delivered predominantly the most of our work through direct delivery so working directly with young people whereas this was a, a very different way of working so it's bringing the two together effectively yeah, yeah. And, and Sonia what about you with the partnership what was the catalyst that that sort of started the process I mean can you think back I mean had you been brought in to turn to us specifically to develop this area uh, or is this something that, that, that there were accidental conversations which then transformed into something or did you sent out with a mission to do something and there was all of all of the above, above. actually. Um, so there were already conversations happening, but with individuals and um, starting to recognise that oh, we should be doing more together. And that was coming from you know organisations like Glasspool. And my my role is director of programmes and partnerships. So it was it was like central to our new strategy to say actually. Um, we cannot achieve what we need to achieve, which is, you know, really supporting an end to poverty um, on our own. So the only way that we can be part of the solution is to be part of it much, much, much more collaboratively. So I was definitely brought in to say, well, how can we work in much deeper partnerships? Um, and uh, the Grant Makers Alliance is, is just one that we hope we hope to be building many more different kind of levels. Um, to really kind of say, well, what's our added value into into supporting, you know, the common problems that we have? So it was it was a little bit of, of all of what you just said, actually. Um, and, and, and Tonya, just a little bit on the sort of the biggest challenges that you faced um, and I suppose the driving force behind developing and maintaining a partnership. Yeah, I think um, in sort of my previous partnerships, one of the biggest challenges was kind of the organisational buy-in. So you'd have individuals who are like, yes, this is absolutely the right thing to do and I really get it. And then they go back to their organisation and their boss or their board or something puts blocks saying, no, I don't, I don't think that's right and we want to own this. And so there's a there, you know, there is a little bit of, of having to let go a little bit if you're working in a collaboration, especially if you want to have an equal partnership, which is one of our, our principles. Um, so you have to let go a little bit of some power, some control at some point. And I think not, not everybody's aligned with that. So that was one, one, of the, one of the kind of challenges. And the other, and, and I think linked to that is that kind of what's in it for me thing, is you need to be super clear for each organization who is involved in the partnership, what's in it for that organization. You're not going to join a partnership if you don't think there's going to be a benefit, that it doesn't somehow align to your strategy, to your organizational thinking, your mission, your values. Um, so really unpacking that and really understanding, and each partner really understanding that for, on behalf of all the other partners is, um, is really critical. And I think um, another challenge is probably, you know, just ways of working. I think organisations have their own different cultures that they bring to the table. Um, so trying to get underneath that. Um, so if, we, if we, let's take it individual grant making. So we make individual grants, we give cash grants to people we don't ask for receipts or accountability back from individuals we give money to. Others do, others give um, goods, not just cash, vouchers. So everyone has a different approach to essentially the same problem. But understanding that and respecting that and appreciating different ways of doing something to, to get a common goal is, is also important and it, and it takes time. I think the biggest thing is to understand all that, unpack all that, build that trusting relationship that Sharon said, you mentioned the word trust, just takes time. And, and, and what about you, Sharon, on the sort of the challenges and the driving forces behind it? And you might also touch on time, particularly with mergers, of when you started the process to whether you'd actually put a realistic time frame on, on when it was going to get completed. Yeah, I mean, I mean, mergers are one of those things that kind of start at a walking pace and they kind of it very often reminds me of dating, actually, uh, mergers. They kind of uh, can start off very kind of, you know, tentatively, leisurely and then all of a sudden you're talking about moving in and you're in that honeymoon phase and you haven't really covered the basics. So things like, you know, how are you going to solve disputes when they happen? Because when you're in that honeymoon phase and everything's working really well and you're connecting really well as a, as a senior leadership group, the trustees are working well, it all seems like you could be putting the dampeners in on it to be having conversations about, well, how, how are we going to solve problems when they come inevitably? And I think, you know, if I, you know, not that we had particularly large problems in the way, but 
um, I think if I was to do it again, I would be bringing those conversations cold to the table, whilst they're still cold, while there's no emotion in it, to really create those frameworks of if, if and when we arrive at a disagreement, how are we going to work them out, those kind of things. Um, I think it's really important that you bring all staff, volunteers, stakeholders, te trusters, trustees, teachers, if need be, if they're important stakeholders, into that conversation sooner rather than later. So you're kind of, you're, you're having those conversations, you're socializing the ideas, you're creating that vision together. Um, so people, because people very often will want us, you know, to feel like they've got skin in the game. And if they don't, then very often that change curve that we're all looking to kind of bring along at the same time becomes longer because people just feel like they haven't got a skin in the game. And, um, you know, I think it's Brenny Brown who talks about one of the greatest shame triggers that we have is not feeling that you can contribute in the workplace. And if you can't contribute to something because you don't know what it is you're supposed to be contributing to, well, that's not really that person's fault. It's the it's the fault of the leadership and the, the trustees in not creating that culture, really. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, um, Catherine uh, um, um, and James, but Catherine, I suppose first is, uh, do you have any comments on, um, on what Sharon and Sonia uh, have said? Yeah, I think they've both made some really interesting comments and I must learn from Sharon actually because I've quite often described the pre-merger stage as dogs sniffing around each other whereas I think dating sounds much nicer doesn't it? I think dating then move in then honeymoon. I will write these things down I think. Um, I've got dancing around handbags. Yes, dancing is good. We like that in there as well. Yeah, um, but I think much of the the problem I think with with partnership is people not being honest maybe not being upfront. I suppose if you've got something you want to achieve, you need to have said that out loud. You need to have articulated it to your partner organization so that you both understand what you're seeking to achieve from this, but achieve it together. Um, and I think some of the comments that were made, you know, particularly about one party needs to succeed more than another, perhaps, or one is seeking to do better out of this partnership than the other. But I think a partnership genuinely only works if, if it is a partnership of equals. And, you know, that point about agreeing up front how to disagree so that you have that respect for each other and you accept that this is a committed arrangement that you ultimately want to work and therefore you are willing to put time and effort into making that happen so I think sometimes it's more that people focus on me rather than we and that can be I think why partnerships don't work because it becomes too much of a self-centered uh, motivation rather than a shared goal that you're trying to work towards. Brilliant. And you James? Yeah I, I think that's right I mean it, it strikes me there's almost I don't want to say positive and negative catalysts, but there are certainly very purposeful catalysts and then more general catalysts. And I think Sonia kind of um, described it quite nicely early when she said, oh, we should work together more. That's a very good uh, purpose, but it's a, quite a general one. Whereas if you really do have a project that you two charities, perfect, you know, it's perfectly aligned with, virtually perfectly aligned with both of their strategies and it's a particular thing they can both get behind, uh, that, 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 that they can identify and they can work towards that that problem again Sonia said problem solving mentality uh, to get that real you know that real focus that I think just it just sharpens the pencil that little bit more uh, and means that, that you know, people are more focused on that I think that's absolutely right you know mutual benefit is absolutely right you know as long you've got to, you've got to respect both parties uh, and make sure that uh, it's not you're not just in it for yourself as, as, as I think all, all speakers have said and then yeah, Sharon was was right. She said earlier, it, so much of it is to do with culture. You know, that you can do as much planning as you want and as much strategic organisation diagrams as you want uh, and, and put all of these sort of charts in and, and, and make sure everyone knows what's going where and who's doing what. But if you haven't managed to assess how the cultures will come together, whether they will or whether they won't, you're missing out an enormous part uh, and one that is quite difficult to to put on a chart you know you've got to see whether people will work together you've got to see fundamentally from the start are people positive about um, what they're doing um, and this this particular project or partnership or venture or whatever it is and you know the, the, the slight undercurrent from one side or one department that perhaps they're not quite in it you know it's got to be identified straight away because there are the seeds of discontent uh, at a later stage. Actually, I think that's a, that culture. I think that's a really important uh, point, isn't it? And uh, I suppose to Sonia or, or, or Sharon, I mean, how do you go about identifying organisations that you want to work with? 
I mean, because it does come down to a cultural thing, doesn't it? And um, and, and the other thing, I think a supplementary one, I can never quite decide, decide, and maybe because I'm slightly disorganised, is that whether you should do these things by accident, i.e. natural sort of enthusiasm and, and, and worry less about the planning bit, or should it be much more by design? I don't know who'd like to kick off. Sharon, why don't you start? Um. I think you, you you do need to be quite purposeful and intentional in, in going into these relationships. Again, staying with the dating theme, I think you know you need to think about these things and you know take them seriously. And and it's great to have those general conversations, but um, I think you know the whole thing about culture, about really um, thinking about what you can achieve, what you can do better of, or do more of, or better, or scale up on as an organisation. You know, so you need to have that kind of either shared or aligned vision of what you want to achieve is, is, is really, really important. So I would say, you know, by design rather than, I mean, sometimes you can have happy, happy, happy accidents, but I would, you know, err more towards the design, really. So do you have a sort of target group of organisations that you'd like to be working more closely within, you know, for, for, for youth enterprise? Young enterprise, yeah, we do. Yeah, for young enterprise, sorry. Yeah, we do. We do have um, organisations that we work really closely with. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely, with the aim of being able to kind of increase the scaling of, of what we do. An example being, being the youth card. A youth card essentially is, a, is an app that young people can basically access opportunities or discounted um, opportunities plus great educational experiences for at the point of, of access. And that is three organisations. That's uh, Speakers for Schools, who designed the, uh, the app, uh, UK Youth, which is the largest network of youth clubs and young enterprise and so collaboratively we feel we can do much more as uh, an all as three organizations three large uk operating organizations that we could alone and what those things are seeking to do is literally create more opportunities for those young people who perhaps would not have access to them without our work now that doesn't create a merge that doesn't require a merger to do that but our uh, purpose is very intentional yeah, so there's that clear cooperation. And, and Sonia, um, what, are, what about you sort of identifying those organisations? And the other question, which I'd like a sort of supplementary, because you've uh, mentioned a number of grant makers, is, is there an optimum number of, of working in partnership? Because I, I can see there's a group and alliance, which you described, but I'm not sure an alliance is, is a partnership. Yeah, it's interesting. So the so the alliance itself is is bigger. So it's, it is an alliance. It's more of a collaboration around a bro much broader, wider purpose. But we've made a kind of we've made a clear terms of reference for that alliance and said actually if there's specific projects or programs we want to collaborate on you can kind of work with just one two three four of, of those members so we're not all collectively working on all the same things um because i think it is a little bit impractical um, and because it takes that time to to really understand each other so there is a subgroup of us working on a specific project that was we've just started so we've said actually what is our role in uh, as grant makers on tackling gendered poverty and so at the beginning of that conversation in fact to your kind of question of who do we work with what we've also said is we're all very similar organizations and so as a collective what would we do differently um, unless we bring in other expertise of other types of organizations so there's a value in kind of really recognizing where where you don't have strengths and what other strengths do you need in that partnership and trying to identify those and reach out and I'd say there's two other kind of aspects of bringing in partners. I think one is a willingness. So like there are organizations I've reached out to, reached out to, reached out to, and they and they they don't want to come back for whatever reason, probably internal reasons. And 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 that's fine. And then you have to go, okay, that's fine. That we need to find another way to solve that gap in this partnership. And the other thing is capacity. Um, and particularly when you're looking at partnerships of unequal size um, and scale. Um, we've got another program, a, co a response program to COVID, working with much smaller partner organisations. And a big thing there is, do they have the capacity to, 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 to deliver on a partnership? That means engaging with us. That means designing things together. That means not us not being an unequal partner, even though we've got a larger organisation. So, so really looking at that, that capacity as well is, is quite critical. And I suppose that's also you giving, having to give up a certain amount of that, of giving more to them but but allowing the ownership to be more equal in its perception yeah, yeah. Catherine on from a legal point of view are there any things any issues that uh, 
that, that charities should be aware of when thinking about partnerships and collaboration? Or have I opened up a, a, a sort of a, a Pandora's box? Uh, not completely. I think whether it's partnerships, collaborations or mergers, I would say objects is king. So you need to look at your organization's charitable objects to see whether there is synergy, to see whether there is compatibility with the other organization or organizations that you're seeking to work with. And, and once you have that solid ground footing, then you can proceed from there in, in really whatever way you choose to in terms of how you want to structure that joint working. Um, you know, sometimes I suppose people see partnership or collaboration as a, a natural uh, lead in to merger. I think sometimes it is and sometimes it very definitely isn't um, and maybe actually the partnership option is one where people say this is this is enough this is all that we would get from it for both of us and we don't see any benefit in proceeding to a merger that's not where the ultimate benefits would be from this arrangement so I think sometimes maybe that just gives you the clarity of thought to say well, maybe we would have had in the back of our minds this as a potential merger option, but now it's become clear that that's not the case. And, and I think other times you might proceed straight to merger. You wouldn't say, well, let's, let's have a period of joint working first to get to know each other. You might be saying, no, there's a clear argument why we should proceed to merger. So there's lots of moving parts. I think often it's about risk. Um, you know, it's trying to isolate any unnecessary risks. It's looking at liabilities. It's looking at making sure two plus two equals five or more. Um, so I think there's, there's whole lots of variations there, but not necessarily legal barriers. I think there are a number of ways that you can overcome any of these issues or obstacles along the way if you take advice at the right time. And going back to Sharon's point earlier, which I know is to do with mergers, but I think uh, equally applies to uh, partnerships is what I call the get out of jail card. So if something goes wrong, uh, how do you then resolve that, particularly as those circumstances is normally where it can become quite contentious. Yeah. Um, and it's just making sure that you can have a, uh, an elegant exit if you, if you need. Uh, James, what about, and you are on mute, um, uh, what about you from an, from an audit or an accounting uh, or even from a finance point of view, are there things that you uh, that people should be aware of? Um, I mean, one of the areas that sort of seems very natural is shared services, um, and obviously there's a VAT issue with that. Uh, yeah, there is. I mean, there's some time ago HMRC brought in you know a shared services uh, legislation that that allowed uh, charities to form. Um, groups that uh, that didn't have to charge VAT, um, but it is very complicated. Uh, it is not wide widespread. It's not widely taken up um, because it's quite difficult. There's some you know, five or, or more very difficult or very onerous criteria you have to comply with. So there was, a, I think, what it shows is there was an attempt by HMRC to recognise and to allow uh, charities to, to to not have to charge VAT on their, their their shared services, but it hasn't really taken off. You know, we've heard on this webcast before that um, another effort by HMRC to try and alleviate those uh, VAT burdens would be appreciated appreciated in the sector. But it, it's it's something that charities at the moment, you know, don't really take advantage of, um, and in some cases can't take advantage of because they don't meet the criteria. So it is a bit tricky. You know, VAT is always a tricky subject. Um, and trying to crowbar, um, you know, the shared services exemptions into uh, uh, into cost sharing groups is, is hard work. Um, so yeah, that, I mean that that's just purely on the tax side. That's that's one example. I mean there, you know, there are reasons why we see so few mergers in the sector. You know, comparatively, um, there are lots of other you know non accounting reasons. There's things like founder syndrome, and there's things like you know, um, trustee boards, um, you know, wanting to protect their brands uh, uh, and any number of other good, very good reasons why uh, mergers are, you know, uh, uh, simply not occurring at the rate that you would have thought they would have done, especially in a time of challenge like we've had. Um, uh, partnerships, however, you know, much more common um, because probably because you don't, you're not, you're not selling everything out to another party. You're not completely losing your identity. You can retain most of what you do. And I think it probably comes more, far more naturally to, to most of the charity sector to, to, to you know, to, to work in partnership rather than to, um, you know, to, to completely throw yourselves at another party and, uh, and either form something completely brand new or certainly lose all your history identity from what are often very, very long standing charities and very personal charities as well. That's the other side. You know, most charities are personal in some way, shape or form to those that are running them. 
uh, whether that's the management board, whether that's the trustees, whether whoever it is, most people are involved in charities because they have a, some sort of personal involvement, personal history, uh, personal you know, empathy with uh, the charity, what it does, its beneficiaries. There's something personal there, which is sort of, which is always going to be different to you know the commercial, the corporate world, where it's, it's simply economic value that you're trying to um, you're trying to maximise. Yeah, no. I, having just recently been through a merger, um, I have to say it is. Um, I, I'm not surprised there aren't more. I mean, the complexity that goes behind it, even when you've got two organisations coming from a you know financially strong position, willing to do something, it is still you know, very time consuming and complex um, and you need a lot of advice and a lot of help. So yeah, I'm, I'm not massively surprised uh, that that hasn't, um, hasn't changed. Um, so just turning back again to you, Sonia, and, 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 to, and to Sharon on partnerships or, or on mar mergers. Generally, where are these driven from? Is this staff? Is this trustees? Is this, uh, you know, individuals? Could be staff or trustees. Um, and, and, and how do you get buy-in and maintain that buy-in within organisations? Sharon, do you want to, because you're not on mute. <laughs> Yeah, sure. From a merger perspective, I mean, I think there's obviously there's always an instigator, isn't there? So whether that's at, uh, you know, trustees, senior management, or <clears throat> it's rarely staff that drive it or volunteers. But I think engagement throughout all of the, that st stakeholder groups are really important. So, for instance, we had a, a joint consultative group that um, really focused on how, how do we drive that shared culture um, as part and parcel of the, the consultations because there'll, you know, there'll be a lot of fear around for both sides in terms of staff, you know, fearing for what's going to happen to their jobs, what's going to happen to them, you know, and quite a lot of that time, you know, you need to be communicating, you need to be over communicating, you need to be consulting with people um, alongside, you know, look, for, look actively for ways of engaging people. So we had about eight work streams at the time, which was all, this was kind of post-merger, but it was implementing the new organisation. So, you know, marketing, finances, um, operations, IT, all the shared services, look, all of those things. But it was looking at ways that we could engage staff um, as well as the, the wider stakeholders. And so maintaining, and, I, and it's also really at the start of the journey, understanding for a group of staff, well, what does success mean to you? Really asking them the question. And then once it kind of makes it to that distilled couple of sentences, you then need to hold yourselves account accountable to that. And Sonia, what about you? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I think um, what we find is we tend to identify a need, so an issue, so and then think, who, which organisation is best placed to work with us here? And then we try to work out who's the best person to introduce us. And we usually go as senior as we can. So that might be a board member might have a contact or the CEO has a contact or, or the directors. Um, so we try to find that entry point and have an initial conversation. Um, and then I think in terms of keeping it going and making it part of a, an organisational thing, if it stays with that person, it's not going to succeed. So the sooner that that contact and that organisation can be passed on to the people who are actually going to deliver on the work and do the stuff together. And if that chemistry works at that level, it's much, much more likely to succeed. Um, and very often we have a lot of introductions to organisations and it doesn't land and for all, all fine reasons and you have to just accept we thought it might work and it, it's not landing, you know, at the level of an operation or it doesn't kind of work enough. Um, we're not sort of aligned enough to be able to make it work. So I think there's there's different ways, but the, the the intro might come from one way, but the drive has to come really a different place in the organisation. And 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 how quickly do you think you can tell whether something's going to really materialise into something, uh, or it's not? Is that is that a sort of you know two or three conversations and you know whether there's a bit of will behind it, or is this something that you have to keep? Uh, dating or dancing around the handbags or whatever it may be for some time and to see where it comes to fruition. I don't know if you know. I don't know if you know until you've had that third or fourth date. Um, but I also think it depends what resources are there for it. So if you've got a chunk of money or you're applying for a chunk of money or you know that you've got a person who's going to be absolutely dedicated to it, it's more likely to happen because there's a resource there to enable uh, if there's not, if it's a, if it's a more kind of esoteric partnership, and we think we want to do a thing, but we're not quite sure what it is, and we don't have the resources, you might have two conversations, let it lie for two years, and come back to it. So, yeah. 
Yeah, brilliant. Uh, and Catherine or, or James, have, uh, have you got any view on this? Are you thinking more on the time scales there, James? Uh, oh, and, and what drive? Yeah, time scales and what drives and what drives the um, uh, the process. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Isn't it? I think from the example of dating, I think that this area clearly isn't a speed dating thing. And I do wonder if that's sometimes why mergers don't happen, because people can be a bit grabby and mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily endear them to you to say, actually, that's not what we want. We want a long term relationship. We want to get to know each other. We want to spend time doing this rather than just to kind of swoop in and and rush things um so i think sometimes that can be a barrier um but i think that all sorts of shapes and sizes aren't there and i think you know charity mergers they're talked up all the time um i often think by charity lawyers because we love charity mergers but uh, you know do i think there will be more of them coming up not necessarily um and i think as you've pointed out uh, charles they take time they cost money so maybe now isn't the time to start exploring a full merger, but maybe it is time to be a bit leaner, to try and be a bit smarter, work with more impact um, and then see what comes from it. But, you know, I think often mergers are cited as the be all and end all and, and some of the biggest ones in the sector, you know, they didn't just happen overnight. So I think, you know, help the aged um, and age concern. Apparently that took three attempts and 10 years for that merger to come off. So I think that's often what people need to have a bit of a reality check about, that this is not a quick fix. Um, and if it is being pursued with that sort of sense of urgency, that would make me think there's something wrong here. There's there's something to be aware of and, and perhaps wary of. And maybe it's an accounting issue as well, James. It might be that sort of pressure. Um, I, I've seen um, I've seen a, a couple of mergers go through where, you know, there was a match between, let's say, an older, asset-rich, historically recognised charity and a much more modern, uh, hand-to-mouth, uh, dealing with modern matters uh, charity. Um, quite high, you know, quite high-profile one from a few years ago, um, which ended up resulting, in, I think, in, in Catch Twenty Two. Um, uh, you know, a very very good modern charity this year. The now the these years with with um, you know with some healthy reserves, which was the, the the sort of the best result from two charities merging. I've seen a very similar situation go very badly wrong, in, in uh, and that did take an awfully long time even to go wrong, let alone to to get fixed. I mean, we're talking you know two three years, and they were still, uh, and and the format was similar. I would go back to uh, my, one of my points and one of our points earlier, which was the cultures weren't aligned in that, that one that went wrong. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think financially, um, if you if when you start to look at you know bringing accounts together, it, it's complex, but it's not it's not particularly onerous or time consuming. So financially, uh, the biggest question we would have as finance as financial parties to any merger would be legally which money goes where, which money belongs where, which money needs to stay in which restricted pots, because that's where, you know, uh, merged parties don't want to fall foul of charity law in particular when it comes to money, and especially when it comes to money, you know, is there, are there restricted funds and, and endowments maybe that are, that do need to stay with certain purposes and therefore need to be dealt with very carefully by the lawyers involved uh, making sure that um, all the, all the restrictions, all the covenants, everything that needs to be dealt with, on the financial side is is that you know other than that on an operational side generally to being staff you know it's it it's it's reasonably um sensible you know it's, it's not a particularly difficult process hr consultants are quite good at you know just dealing with you know what are essentially probably likely to be um two companies uh, merging together um, charitable companies so it's that but it, it is more about the impact of charity law that that might well hold up I would say and elongate a merger process rather than anything else sorry Catherine no no I, I, but but I, but I think I, you know most people talk about mergers because there are too many charities and too many charities doing the same thing and this to this to me is a too simplistic uh, sense of a solution and I, I mean I know from my side you, you know when we were looking at the merger you're your expectation is, quoting Catherine, you know, put two and two together, you're going to make five or six. But, you know, you don't actually know whether that's going to be the case. And the other big thing is that, of course, while you're merging, are you then able to continue delivering your beneficiaries? Or does this become a big distraction? 
Um, and therefore, I think actually this probably neatly leads into uh, uh, of why people look looking much more towards partnerships rather than rather than mergers. Um, and the other thing is, if you look at East Time Prime Timers report each year, most mergers come because one organisation or another has got itself into a financial pickle and it's being bailed out. I do slightly question why the other organisation might bail it out. But anyway, we might move on swiftly from that. Just on that point, um, so to, uh, to, to, to Sonia first, but how do you m measure what success looks like? So you, you, you've, you've created this grant makers uh, alliance, you've got a number of subgroups. So ha have you actually defined what, what success is going to look like and over what time period you're going to measure that? The simple answer is no with the GMA because we're very, very early uh, in our conversations. Um, but I think once we've set the problem out a bit more kind of substantively, that will help. Um, in previous partnerships, um, it, we've, we've, we've been quite structured about measuring it, like having frameworks, evaluation frameworks, and clear governance structures over the partnership. So, you know, some, I think Sharon was talking about you know, how do you resolve conflicts? And so just sort of setting all that out in collaboration agreements and memorandums of understanding and just being very clear right from the start. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I think, again, I think it's a long term game, I think. Yeah, it's it's part part and parcel. Keep measuring it, keep looking at it, keep reviewing it, keep analysing it. And there are moments in partnerships where they start to go a bit sour, and you need to recalibrate a bit. But being able to recognise that, and I think I think what I haven't said is that we have these four principles in the GMA of, of how we want to work together, which are based on equity, um, uh, transparency, accountability, and diversity. And so I think if we can hold ourselves to account to those principles in all that we do and the ways that we work, and that will all need a bit of unpacking, what does that really mean to be diverse organisations here in this space and doing this thing together? Um, that will help us when we come to those crunchier moments. Brilliant. And what about you, Sharon? Measuring success. You could do it for the merger or for partnerships, I don't mind. Yeah, I mean, just think about the, about the merger. I mean, you, you always have an, you know, an initial business case for the, for the merger. And I would really say use those consultation opportunities with your staff really seriously to add value to those business case um, documents so that you're building a case for success that everybody is invested in. And um, you then, I, you know, as, as Sonia was saying, then you, you do hold yourself accountable to those success measures because with the best will in the world, not everybody's going to work through the layers of what success means to different people. And I think through a, things like the joint consultative group, things like trustees, you know, be sponsoring a certain word stream, you can start to um, have a real uh, matrix approach to success and I think I think that's really key because otherwise you're going to end up either with a brand that's really out of alignment with the rest of the organization or your operations are or or some some elements of the functions um, are some way down the line in the change in the change role so that's the reason why I would say engage your staff as soon as possible engage them meaningfully in in the, the consultation and 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 also if i take if i understand what you're saying is that engage them into why you're doing that and let them come and build that story for you and build the rationale Absolutely. so that's part of the evolution a hundred percent it is evolution not revolution if you're going to make yeah. it stay yeah no absolutely um so really coming to the sort of the final uh, question, which is, I, I suppose, the, one of the purposes of having this session is um, we've obviously been through a or we are going through a fairly serious pandemic, which has challenged, uh, I think, most organisations, I think there are very few either within the charity sector or outside. Uh, that haven't had to face it. We have certainly seen and heard from the press that a lot of organisations have been forced to work in partnership to be able to deliver to their beneficiaries. Um, but as we're sort of coming out of the pandemic, hopefully, touch wood, um, do you think that, 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 that attitudes towards partnerships are going to change? Do you think we're going to see an awful lot more, sort of an explosion of partnerships? Or do you think we're just going to sort of revert back to the way we were always doing it? I don't know who would like to open up. James, should we start with you first? You're on mute. I'd like to say uh, there'd be many more. Um, I do think, you know, as I said, I think mergers are difficult. So partnerships, but partnerships, you know, it's definitely something that we've seen more of during the pandemic. I've seen in, in my own client base, so a couple of 
couple of clients who have been the funnels for COVID relief grants in their particular sector. And I'm thinking of um, in the homelessness sector, Homeless Link. Um, we've seen more charities like the Education Endowment Foundation receiving money um, direct from government and working with delivery partners. You know, you hear, you hear the phrase delivery partners an awful lot these days. Um, and I suppose there is that slight um, parent subsidiary type of relationship there where, you know, you, the, 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 um, the, the grant maker, if you like, is, 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 uh, is subordinating or is using another party. Just that slight realignment between, um, you know, a true partnership, I think, would be, would be beneficial in those cases. But you're still seeing, I think you're seeing the, 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 the beginnings of a, a, a real change in people's attitudes to working with other people, with other charities now. I think, it, you know, it's almost become quite, you know, second nature. You don't just look at yourself and go, all right, how can we deliver this? You look around and say, how can we deliver this with other people? A lot of it has come, or some of it has come, the interest has come from the central funders and government who have said, look, let's, let's, let's give bigger lumps of grant out to, um, to groups of charities or to a charity who is going to work in a group. And, and almost then... Um, pass the administrative administrative um, duties over uh, to try and reduce perhaps their own administrative costs. But you know there, there are all these sort of things that are, the stars are aligning. I think to see much more um, partnership working across the sector. And I think with the right mindset, an awful lot of charities will get, will, will benefit from it. Brilliant. And and you, Sonia? Yeah, I think I think that was great. I, I agree with what you just said. I think I think what we've seen is much more. You know starker inequalities through COVID. I think it's becomes even more obvious to some people who maybe hadn't seen those vast inequalities um, in the country before are suddenly seeing them. And I think there's also been this wonderful shift of communities, you know, local volunteer and mutual aid groups. So people taking more power at a community level. And I think if large charities ignore that shift in power and that thinking about power and don't work with the communities and with the organisations that are on the ground, actually working directly with people and listening to them, I think we're actually going to become redundant. So I think I think that people will start to kind of say, no, this isn't what my community needs. You have to be listening to us. And the way to listen to us is to work with our organisations. And so in order to, to remain relevant and part of the solution and not part of the problem moving forward in tackling some of those inequalities is to work in partnership. So. Um, and I, I think it's, it would be insane of any one organisation to think that they can solve um, some of these really, really big issues alone. Um, and the other, the other really practical thing I've noticed, it's just a small observation, but when we were in offices and pre-COVID, we'd set up a partnership meeting three months down the line because practically we all had to be in the same location and travel. And, and of course now with Zoom and all the rest of it, um, they're two weeks in advance. So things can move slightly quicker in some ways as well. So partnerships are kind of evolving in a way that they would have taken a lot longer before. But, but has that made it more, because you talked about the importance of building relationships, has that made it more difficult to, to develop relationships because you haven't been able to meet people physically? Yeah, I think there's the downsides in that you don't build that um, more personal relationship because you, there's an organisation relationship, there's a who are you as an organisation, there's also who are you as a human being working with me and how can we get the best out of each other and how can we work well together? And I think some of that gets reduced a bit because you've been not meeting. Brilliant. Sharon? Yeah, so it's great where what, what, what Sonia said about, about the whole kind of uh, meet local organisations meeting uh, national organisations or larger organisations, because I think that's really important. You can start to see that come through now that, you know, gone are the days of that is that kind of paternalistic approach to local organisations, because without local organisations, national organisations have no network because the network is your local community. And I, and I think you're also... I hope we're also seeing a change in the leadership of national organizations you see a more vulnerable braver sense of leadership where people kind of are more more honest in saying I don't know what I don't know they're more I hope more authentic in being able to be open to I guess the the, the real potential and benefits of collaboration because of what's happened to us because over the last 12 months, you know, the, the most experienced person in the room didn't know the answers to the questions. So it required us thinking and being together in a way that we've never um, experienced before. 
so I think that you are seeing a shift in how people behave towards each other and you know and long, long may that continue yeah it was rabbits or headlights or actually proactively getting on and doing something without going necessarily through the chain of command Catherine the final word I, I'm not sure I'm in cahoots with the rest of the panel um I think there might be more of an appetite to explore partnership but I also think there's a saturation point where you can't have too many active partnerships on the go at one time so there might come a point where actually if you're an in-demand partner organization you might be saying no it's not that we didn't we don't want to work with you but at the moment we can't take on another uh, partnership arrangement because we're already doing others um, and I also wonder in the pandemic a number of charities I think have overcome obstacles and they've overcome them themselves and I wonder whether they might be saying actually yeah we thought we needed to merge or we thought we needed to partner with others but actually we needed to modernize we needed to evolve and we've done that at pace and now we can take stock a bit and see where we go from here so I'm not necessarily saying there won't be more partnerships but I'm not so sure they're going to be as immediate as we might think. And I do wonder about whether there's a limit on how many you can effectively have on the go at any one time. But I, I, I have to say, I do hope board, trustee boards particularly are questioning whether they should be having more partnerships and whether they can get a, a better, sorry, forgive the expression, bang for their buck for their, for their beneficiaries if they do work, work more closely, be more creative in that. Um, anyway, well, I think that um, comes to uh, comes to an end of the session. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Sharon and Sonia, Catherine and James uh, for sharing their views and giving us an excellent insight into partnerships uh, and mergers. Um, my key takeaways, communication, and probably communication and communication. I have to repeat that three times because I think that is absolutely having a clear vision uh, and purpose uh, and accountability. Um, and I think finally, this is not about you or about me. It's all about what's in the best interest of our beneficiaries. Um, and by working together, can we have a greater impact? <laughs>